I'm Dennis Anderson, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Duluth Mayor Emily Larson is here tonight to talk about the key initiatives that she outlined in her State of the City speech this week. In a time when America seems more divided by the day, we will tell you about an effort to bring citizens together for the good of democracy. And now is your chance to share your favorite family meals in the great Minnesota recipe. That's a new cooking show on WDSE. These stories and voices of the region coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello once again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Julie is off tonight, but she will return next week. And here's a look at some of the week's headlines. Well, the shipping season is officially underway with the first ship arrivals of the season. The storied vessel Arthur M. Anderson sailed under the aerial bridge just after noon Wednesday, marking the first arrival of the season. The American Mariner was the first ship through the Superior Entry. The Twin Ports also welcomed a new Coast Guard cutter to its home port this week. The Spar, a 225-foot buoy tender that had been stationed in Alaska, will now call Duluth home. She sailed into port Wednesday during a March snow flurry, ready to keep the shipping channels open and assume the duties of keeping commerce flowing on Lake Superior. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and Duluth-based PAMSA has a number of events planned to recognize victims of assault. Anger Tower will be lit teal beginning this Sunday through April the 10th, and on April 5th, advocates will be wearing teal and posting support for survivors on social media. More events can be found on the program for aid to victims of sexual assault, Facebook and Twitter feeds. Well, spring may be slow in arriving in the region, but just like the first robins of the year, road construction <laughs> will soon be here. The Minnesota Department of Transportation unveiled its list of projects this week. Most visible this year will be continued work on the Twin Ports Interchange, new bridges on Highway 61 north of Two Harbors, and a roundabout that will be constructed on Highway 194 and Midway Road. Duluth Mayor Emily Larson delivered her State of the City speech to a live audience this week, marking a transition from a difficult two-year period. The mayor outlined some goals to improve the economy, bring people back to the downtown area, and provide high-speed internet service to residents of the city. So joining us now with more on her vision for the city of Duluth is Emily Larson, the mayor of this town. Welcome back, Mayor. Good Thank to see you, you again. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm so sorry I laughed when we talked about road construction. Hey, it happens. <laughs> it's always too soon. It's, it's always, always too soon. Well, it, it comes every year, I guess. But <laughs> That's right. Now, one of the major emphasis <laughs> in your speech the other night, Mayor, was economic development. Yes. In, in what areas do you believe Duluth has grown pretty well economically during Absolutely. your time as mayor. Mm -hmm. And what do you expect uh, the future to bring economically to the city? Yeah, really about, actually more than half of my speech was really focused on economic development, mm -hmm. talking about the elements that I think we have done well, which is really packaging the factors that business and commerce need to be stable to grow your business. So having f um, housing, having infrastructure, clean water, um, all of those pieces that are really core functions of the city. So really laid out our success, you know, 1,500 new housing units, mm -hmm. 14 miles of streets being done this summer compared to two, my, the, the first um, year I took office, uh, lead line work, all sorts of really important things. And then I really talked about the new areas I'd like the city to go in, which is really looking at our overall economic development strategy, asking ourselves some core questions about whether or not the city can move out of the way yeah. and reduce some policies. Which brings the question, you did use the term a holistic view yeah. of economic development. What does that mean? Well, for me, and I think for most people, it recognizes that economic development isn't just one factor, right? I can't just go to work and be economically successful. I need to be able to have affordable childcare. I need to have a place to live. I need to have a way to get to and from work. So the approach that we've really worked on up until now has been about how to broaden economic development to ensure that when you're going to work, you've got a place to come home to, a way mm -hmm. to get there, and a way to you know keep all the basic services going. So what do businesses look for then when they're contemplating perhaps moving to a city like Duluth? Yeah, sometimes 
sometimes businesses are looking for uh, you know, direct economic investment, and that's something that we can do. Sometimes they're looking for location and adjacency that fits with housing development and other um, physical elements that are important to them, that we can do. Sometimes they're looking for clarity on how, how does this happen if we come in and get a permit, What's the reliable way in which that happens? How will you interact and support the business? Most and really all businesses are looking for enthusiasm. They're yeah. looking for an understanding and a commitment from people who work in City Hall that we are here to help you be successful. You announced a downtown task force. Yeah. What's that all about? Yes, yeah, so downtown is, I mean, it's incredible, it's so beautiful downtown. And in the past two years, we have seen changes, like all downtowns. Um, many more people are working from home. We have some retail storefronts that are open that weren't open. Uh, we have people who you know, need supports that are living outside and we wanna help them find stable housing. So we have announced a really exciting task force led by GDC, Greater Downtown, um, uh, the Greater Downtown Council mm -hmm. Director, Christy Stokes, and then Duluth Superior Community Area Foundation President, Sean Flurkey. You touched really on a number of other subjects too. You, you want every resident, you said, to have access to high-speed fiber optic internet within six years. That's right. How do you propose to get that I'm so excited about this, Denny. I have to tell you, I feel so strongly. I mean, this is also an economic development. It is a workforce competition. It is an access to education piece. All of that is bundled into access to internet. As we've seen the last two years, there's not much you can do and be competitive in if you don't have access to that. So uh, we'll be bringing forward our full proposal to the council to adopt. We're gonna start with a pilot project in Lincoln Park that's gonna connect 2,000 homes. We have about 35,000 homes across the city of Duluth. Right now, only 6% of Duluthians have access to high-speed fiber, and mm -hmm. that's, that's just not acceptable. We can do better, we can do more, and we have a plan. And speaking of homes, you keep talking about the need for affordable housing here yeah. in the city. Is affordable housing or lack of such a stumbling block for this town? Yes. It absolutely is. Uh, as we have seen, wages are going up now because the market's requiring that with a workforce shortage and other pieces, but the cost of living is going up. And I, in every single age bracket, we are seeing people really struggle to have a place that they can afford that feels safe, that is reliable and is healthy. So yes, affordable housing is absolutely holding us back. We are also doing some packaging around um, you know, land parcels that yeah. can be built out for additional single family home development. We need townhomes, we need single family homes, and then we also just need straight up affordable housing for people to be able to have a safe place to lay their head at night. I have time for one final oh, question, good. Mayor. Uh, street reconstruction yes. has been one of your priorities. What's new on that? Well, we're gonna actually roll out our public meeting starting next week. You know, we have a five-year plan that we keep updating and, and moving towards and getting great progress. The last two years, we've done 31 miles of road. Uh, this year, we're gonna do 14 miles. And uh, so the neighborhood meetings will start so we can start engaging the public, I think, in the next two weeks. Mayor Emily Larson, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Denny. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you for you. being here tonight. Well, it's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist covering stories of interest in the Northland. This week our reporter is Heidi Holton from KAXE Community Radio in Grand Rapids. One of the stories we've been covering recently is the announcement by ISD 318, that's the Grand Rapids and Big Fork School District. They are needing to make cuts to faculty due to the budget. We heard from a student who organized a walkout to support the teachers last Friday, March 25th. It's really important to us because like being able to relate to the teachers and being able to relate to the actual stuff that is being taught is like the number one, like it's our number one job. Superintendent of Schools, Matt Gross, joined us as well to help us understand why the cuts are happening. Turns out he was proud of the students who walked out. Well, I think as a society, we've, we've seen things go the other way when people are unhappy or questioning decisions or want to voice their opinion. I think we've seen adults not always carry that out in the best way. I think our students did a good job of carrying themselves. Uh, it's important that their voices are heard. Student agency is important and doing that in a respectful way. 
in a way that's safe is really important, and I think our students did that. One of the reasons that the students like Levi Mitchell were organizing a walkout was because some of their favorite teachers, the newer hires, the younger teachers, are on the chopping block. He explained that state statutes and teacher contracts govern who gets cut. Superintendent Gross told us more about how the system of school funding works in Grand Rapids and Big Fork. I think it's fair and accurate to say that schools in Minnesota are underfunded. And I think one of the metrics for that or one of the reasons that I feel confident saying that is that 70% of the school districts in the state of Minnesota depend on their communities to supplement state revenue. The average operating referendum in the state of Minnesota is over $800 per student. If we had the average operating referendum in the state, if we were just an average school district, we wouldn't be making reductions this spring. We wouldn't have needed to make reductions last spring, and we wouldn't need to make reductions in the future. The school board and district administrators are now working on how to get local support for a referendum to better serve the students of Grand Rapids and Big Fork. Also big news in our region was the finding of a wild deer within Grand Rapids city limits with chronic wasting disease or CWD. DNR are now taking steps to reduce the potential spread by selectively culling deer in Southwest quadrant of Grand Rapids. Dr. Lindsay Chartel is the acting Northeast region wildlife manager in the division of fish and wildlife. So we need to get on the ground and see what the deer population is like and what their movements are so that we can target any deer that might have come into contact with this positive doe. CWD can cause population declines where the disease becomes endemic. Research out of Wisconsin has shown that CWD-infected deer die at three times the rate of uninfected animals and they can continue to spread prions in the environment, which are very difficult to destroy. So we will have USDA Wildlife Services out sharpshooting and trapping deer in that southwest part of Grand Rapids. Dr. Chartel says that the deer will be sampled and then sent to a local processor who will distribute the venison that isn't infected to the community. The DNR will also be sampling roadkill deer within a 10 mile radius. With colder temperatures and ground frost, our early bird fishing guide, Jeff Sundin, thinks this means that we still have ample opportunity to continue to ice fish with tulipy, burbot, and perch biting right now. The deep snow this winter and warm-ups, but then more snow have led to some favorable conditions for ice fishing in portable houses or walking out on the lakes with good old-fashioned buckets to sit on. Jeff thinks April will see some good ice fishing still ahead, though he has predicted April 28th as a possible ice out for area lakes in Itasca County. It wasn't too hard to, to find a place to fish because all the holes that were drilled previously were still open. They just looked like little holes in the snow, maybe three or four inch diameter dark spots that you could see. And if you went over to those little dark spots and kicked at them, you could find the uh, open ice hole underneath. So I never even had to use my auger yesterday. I just walked around looking for other people's holes. So whoever drilled all them, thank you. That was a lot easier. <laughs> A nonpartisan grassroots effort to tackle democracy challenges and build relationships begins at the end of April. Uniting for Democracy in the Northland will be implemented locally by Northspan in collaboration with two national groups. Here to tell us more and how you can get involved is Amber Lewis, a Lead for Minnesota fellow serving Northspan for this project. And Amber, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. What is this Lead for Minnesota all about? So Lead for Minnesota is the state affiliate of the national nonprofit Lead for America, which places um, young individuals in leadership positions um, with local organizations. So I've been placed with the nonprofit Northspan. So what are the goals then? So the goals of, of Lead for America are really to bring young people into communities that they have some connection with 
and find ways to strengthen and build up those communities. Look at the challenges that exist in those communities and how do we begin to address those? So when you're addressing that, do you look at ways that uh, people can get along better? Is that what you're really striving for? Or So fellows um, in the Lead for America program can definitely address a lot of different issues. They're, they're addressing issues from health equity to environmental issues. My um, program specifically is the Welcoming Community Program. So I'm the Welcoming Community Program Coordinator with Northspan. Um, so with that, we're looking at how can we make this region more welcoming for everybody mm. here, for people from diverse groups, from different lived experiences. Um, so how so, do you accomplish that? Yeah, so that is is one part where we're looking at bringing people together across divides. We have so much divisiveness right now in our nation and right. even on a local level. How do we begin to bridge those divides and bring people together to solve these challenges that we have in our communities? So how do interested people apply to participate? So we have an application that's open right now on our UR, it's uraction.org website and you go to programs there and you'll see Uniting for Democracy in the Northland. This is a regional initiative. So the, we're looking at like the seven county area of the Arrowhead and then also even into Superior, Wisconsin. I think on your web page it says you have to have a strong connection to Minnesota. What does that mean? Um, so for the, the, particularly the Uniting for Democracy program, like we want, we want those individuals to live in that area of Northeastern Minnesota, because mm. we believe local people need to be solving some of these local challenges that we have. So having that strong connection to our local region and understanding the challenges we face is really important. Yeah. So what problems really need to be solved that perhaps will be or should be tackled? So we don't know what the specific problem is yet, but some examples are, are misinformation, toxic polarization, um, anything you know that really divides us that we've seen in, in our communities nowadays will be, will be fair game for that, that group yeah. um, looking at to choose a problem. So when you say they can apply to participate, uh, on your webpage too it says you have to have a, a strong connection uh, with being able to share feelings and share stories and share uh, uh, really an, uh, a methodology, I guess, uh, in trying to come to some kind of conclusion. So can you talk a little bit about how you do, you do you debate or how do, you, how do you go about that? Yeah, so we'll be having a workshop on April 30th and we have people from um, Uniting for Democracy that'll be coming to Minnesota um, because they're a national organization and we'll be hosting this workshop where we're learning constructive dialogue skills. We do what we call the ABCs of dialogue and learn to really have dialogue across difference, how to really listen and explain your position on something. And then problem solving. We'll be looking at a problem tree analysis where we look at the causes and effects of whatever problem we've decided to address and really go in depth. And then out of that will come this community venture, this project where we're addressing as a core group this one cause yeah. of the, this bigger problem. Um, so we'll have our, our small effect in some way on that, on that big problem. So can people then come armed with information about maybe problems they see here in Northeastern Minnesota? Definitely, so anybody who apply, applies for the program will be asking for their input on what are some problems that you might consider um, that you want to address. Mm -hmm. Politics in our country doesn't always allow for compromise. Uh, how can dialogue change that? Um, to be clear, this is this is definitely not a political venture. It's it's you know nonpartisan, um, but dialogue can help us find that common ground. We we spend so much time looking at the things that divide us, but how can we find those those common areas where we can work together on a project and bring solutions? So, do you teach people how to dialogue? So once again, in that workshop on April 30th, we will have a, a training session on how to do that constructive dialogue, how to dialogue you know, beyond the divisiveness that usually happens around controversial mm -hmm. issues. So what is the goal then? What's the overall goal? The overall goal is really in bringing people together in, in the community across Northeastern Minnesota, to talk about, you know, talk about these differences that divide us, but then find those common areas that we can work on. What is a project we can come together on and say, hey, we have these differences, but this is something we can work together on and make our community better. It sounds like you're ready. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Amber Lewis, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you having me. Well, our viewers have been asking for it, and this spring, WDSE will produce a new local cooking show. The Great Minnesota Recipe will feature local cooks with their own special take on Northland cuisine. Producer Megan McGarvey spoke with fellow producers here at the station to discuss why this project needs your help to make it happen. Cooking really shows 
who a person is in a way that they may not be able to tell you. And I think being able to see inside someone's kitchen gives you a, a new perspective on food or on life, really. You know, whether you're from Norway or you're from China, or if you're part of the first peoples of this land, there's a lot of cultural diversity in food. Food is an incredibly powerful tool to learn about different cultures. So many of us love so many different options of cuisine, and I don't think, personally, I don't know anyone who just stays in one lane of cuisine. So it's a really easy stepping stone. If you already love all these different types of foods, it's a, a great way to connect to teaching about the culture. WDSC WRPT was selected out of many other PBS stations across the country applying for a national grant for the Great Minnesota Recipe. This is all stemming from national PBS's The Great American Recipe. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. This is the opportunity to share my story. To be here was a huge surprise. We want to fall in love with your recipes. I am ready, I'm excited, I'm going to do it. I'm so excited to be competing for one of my recipes to become a tradition for other people. This is a dish that my dad taught me. It's the flavors of home. Welcome to The Great American Recipe. The Great American Recipe, a new cooking competition coming this June to PBS and the PBS app. So this is a Minnesota spin on nationwide programming that is celebrating cultural, culinary, diverse backgrounds. The Great Minnesota Recipe is a four-part series that will premiere on PBS North on June 2nd. Our first three episodes will be documentary style and we'll take a deep dive into our three cooks we'll be featuring on the show. Each of those episodes will explore their culture, their heritage, their family, their recipes, and just why they love to cook. And in our fourth episode, we'll bring all three cooks back for a competition where they'll create a typical Minnesota meal with their unique cultural flair. Think hot dish. A lot of times people say that food is very reflectant of cultural values, cultural ways people of people. It brings us together. For Native communities, feasts are very important to us. And so the Great Minnesota Recipe not only is a fun focus on food, but it also is really important to us to dive deep into these different diversities of Minnesota and find out truly what makes them special because we're all special and when we highlight and illuminate different diverse cultures, I feel like it brings us all closer as a community. We're currently casting for our cooks for the Great Minnesota Recipe. I want the cooks at home to know that whether you are a first time cook or you've been cooking for 30 years, you can be part of the show. I don't think you should be scared to apply if just because you haven't been cooking for your whole life. Or, or if you have been and you're scared of the camera, don't be. Let us worry about that. We will make it comfortable for you and we will make the experience so incredibly enjoyable that if you have just any part of you that wants to apply, I think you should. I think it would be really special for you to be part of it and we would love to meet you. So if you're interested in applying to be one of the cooks for the Great Minnesota Recipe, go to our website, WDSE.org. And that's our time this week, but you can keep up with the latest updates by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Bookmark the WDSE website for program schedules, news about the station, and upcoming events. And download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs anytime you would like. And for news from the Minnesota Legislature, tune in to the Minnesota Channel, one of our five digital channels. You'll find gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of events at the state capitol every day the legislature is in session. And watch Minnesota Legislative Report this Sunday at 5 p.m. with our host, former state lawmaker, Tony Sertich. Thanks to our guests and the crew in the studio. I'm Dennis Anderson. Good night, everybody, and be kind.